I'm in Juneau. Juneau, Alaska has been called one of America's most scenic capital cities. But in the summertime, this coastal town of 30,000 residents becomes a tourism mecca. Cruise ships regularly port in Juneau, and passengers fill the downtown's historic and shopping districts. But natural wonders like nearby Mendenhall Glacier and its 15 miles of trails are very accessible, and sightseeing tours are plentiful. The Mount Roberts Tram is the self-proclaimed number one tourist attraction in Juneau, offering immediate views of the entire area, and if you hike up the back side of Mount Roberts, you'll be awarded a free ride down. Juneau is a, is a sort of a quirky town in, in, in the way that it, it goes through waves of activity. In, in January, of course, the, the legislature kicks off and all the people, the staffers and everything that come, the lobbyists, of course the legislators themselves in this town, the activity picks up dramatically. Just about the time they scoot out of town, or just before, tourists uh, hit town. The, the cruise ships start coming in and uh, the town becomes active in a whole different way. And the only potential downside is because it is such a small state, you know, you're down getting your lunch or you're having a coffee, you know, down at the coffee shop and uh, the person who called you about you know this issue and they were you know very upset and everything and you're dealing with is sitting right next to you you know and and so you have to be careful about uh, rumors and innuendos uh -huh. uh, certainly so here we are at the governor's residence hi it is the original structure the house was built in 1912 they were allocated forty thousand dollars to build the house let's come into the ballroom commonly known as the ballroom because in um, World War II, the soldiers used to come up here and dance. They were given $1,000 for furnishings and they spent half of it on this piano. Something fell off. <laughs> See, it has been here a long time. <laughs> Warren Harding was our only president that's been here as an acting president. He was known for giving porch speeches. That's where he liked to talk from. When um, Warren Harding left here, he actually um, died on that trip before he got home. Guess that puts us 0 for 1. <laughs> <laughs> The makeup of this area changed from Clinkett Fishing Grounds to Gold Mine Town in 1880, when a mining engineer offered a reward of 100 Hudson Bay blankets and work for the tribe to anyone who could direct his men to gold. Chief Cowie of the Auk Bay Clinkett tribe brought two men, Richard Harris and Joe Juno, to what became the first major gold discovery in Alaska. And many remnants of these enormous mining operations still exist today, including the famous Treadwell Mine on Douglas Island, which flooded and partially collapsed in 1917. In its prime, the Treadwell mines were working round the clock, with 960 stamps crushing a then world record 5,000 tons of ore daily. It was a town of its own, with amenities like a gymnasium, swimming pool, bowling alley, and library, though it was notoriously dangerous, earning the nickname The Butcher Shop after an explosion in 1911 killed 37 miners. By 1917, 10 million tons of ore had been removed from the ground. And in April of that year, approximately three million tons of seawater filled those tunnels in just three and a half hours, a disaster the Treadwell Mining Complex never recovered from. All said, it accounted for 66 of the $160 million worth of gold mined out of the Juneau area between 1880 and 1944. Among the many remnants of Juneau's old gold mining days is the beach itself which is composed entirely of tailings from the Treadwell Mine. 
there were five breweries in all the state of Alaska, and it was about the turn of the century, you know, the gold rush mining days. They were making beer for all those thirsty miners. There was one brewing company right here locally. It's called the Douglas City Brewing Company. And what they decided to do was to try to recreate that original beer that was being made. And so they found out that this fellow had come all the way from Czechoslovakia to start the Douglas City Brewing Company. And when he started, he um, actually was going to be a miner. You know, he wanted to get some gold, but he realized that it really wasn't all that uh, great mining. So what he did was <laughs> he went into the family business, which happened to be brewing beer. So he took the barrels of beer, and uh, for the fermentation process, he needed somewhere to keep it at a cool, consistent temperature. So he put it down in the mine shafts. And so it was pretty neat because it was making that beer, um, it was actually brewing in a little bit warmer temperature than you might normally brew beer. So what that would do is increase the alcohol just a bit and lower the carbonation. So those miners loved it. And so uh, what Marcy and Jeff did was basically they just took all that information and they tried to recreate that original beer. And that's the Alaskan Amber we have today. If you have any more questions, um, I can answer them. I, I have something hopefully. I want to show you actually. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this magazine, Stuff Magazine. Oh, it's trashy uh, men's magazine. <laughs> the show Stuff you. Magazine. But uh, and this is this is this month's mm -hmm. issue. But anyway, they have an article in here about. Uh, see if I can oh, really? Find it. Well, there's <coughs> some yeah. half-naked women uh, about the 80 best American beers. Oh yeah, actually. And I wanted to show you that Alaska Amber comes in what number two. Number two. Right there. Apparently, Alaska Amber is good for session drinking, uh, making the opposite sex more attractive, hey. and for beer snobs. That's right. We're good for all those things. So uh, one of the perks of the, the Alaskan Brewing Company is you can sample the brews that they brew. Um, before we started filming earlier, I already made it through one through three. They go one through six, uh, lightest to darkest. So I already tried the summer ale, the pale ale, and the amber ale, and now I'm on number four, fourth uh, darkest. This is uh, the ESB Extra Special Bitter, one of my, my second favorite of the six, I think. Good stuff. The Alaska Marine Highway Ferry System connects 30 Alaskan communities from the Aleutian Islands of southwestern Alaska to the Inside Passage of Southeast and on to British Columbia and Washington. With some careful studying of routes and schedules, the travel opportunities are immense. You can plan your own itinerary and stay as long as you like. Bring your car and your kids. With vessels ranging from 200 to 600 passengers, ferries not only provide access to communities off the main road systems, but can also get you to towns the larger cruise ships cannot. While there are bunks, cafeterias, and lounges, accommodations aren't quite as luxurious as a cruise ship. Though the views, guaranteed, are just as grand. Beginning in the Juno douglas area, we'll be traveling the Alaska Marine Highway and inter-island ferry systems throughout southeast Alaska. We'll make stops in Petersburg to explore the wonders of Frederick Sound, then on to the town of Klawak to learn about the enormous undertaking of totem pole restoration, before hopping a flight to the annual Dog Salmon Festival in the village of Cake. A journey covering nearly 450 miles and four different islands of southeast Alaska. Breakfast in Petersburg, a little bit of egg, a whole lot of salmon. Petersburg is proud owner of the nickname Little Norway. It was founded by Norwegian fisherman Peter Bushman, who realized it was possible to ship fish all the way to California by using the very slow melting ice from nearby Lakani Glacier. Petersburg still honors its roots and is known to have larger celebrations for Norwegian Independence Day than for the 4th of July. Fishing is also still the major industry of Petersburg, and Extra Tufts, the footwear of choice. The waters of Frederick Sound happen to be prime kayaking and whale watching areas, with day trip and week long kayaking tours available through the iceberg riddled waters leading up to Lakani Glacier. Or you can hire someone like Vern Anderson to show you around. Even the fish are embarrassed to ride in this one. Can you bring them back? Where are you taking us, Vern? Oh, uh, out to uh, Big Creek there. And now it's further west for the uh, um, whales, so. Fort's Dimper, Fort's what does Dimper. that mean? Yeah. yeah. This, is what, this is what it means, Fort's Dimper. Yeah. Just one of the three Fort's Dimpers. 
We're about to uh, do a combination halibut fishing, whale watching trip. So it looks like we're right next to a pod of about four or five, maybe six, humpback whales who are spouting and breaching, jumping up out of the water. We saw two or three do that. Now there's an estimated 6,000 uh, humpback whales that live in the North Pacific, and of those 6,000, 1,000 or so come up to the Southeast Alaska area for feeding during the summer. And of those 1,000, about 500 or so um, come to this area, specifically in Frederick Sound. So this makes it an extremely um, good area for viewing humpback whales. Humpback whales have several methods of catching their prey and one of them is called bubble netting. What that involves is a group of whales uh, will get together and uh, in a series of choreographed movements will um, surround a school of fish or krill, which are small shrimp-like uh, creatures, and they'll start blowing bubbles. And what this does is uh, when these, when these uh, fish and krill sense bubbles being blown, their instinct is to go in the opposite direction. So there's three uh, jobs also that the whales can have. One um, is uh, one set of whales is making this, the circle with the bubbles, another set is choreographing it basically by uh, calling out, and the third one, uh, the lucky one, will get to come up in the center of the bubble net and eat the fish. Or so the whaleologists tell me. Burn, master of the seas. <laughs> Gotten our fill of whale watching and now we're going to do a little halibut fishing. Now we're going to catch a whale. We're going to catch, we're going to catch a humpback whale. <laughs> The idea of this is uh, you can let this down fairly fast and the uh, line will go back and, you know, grab on the line. So it's called spreader bar, but I think I like calling a coat hanger. <laughs> a couple hundred more feet to go there, dude. <laughs> this is tiring. Whatever's comfortable for you, I've kind of put it right here. And it's, it's, uh... Jabbing me in the junk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cheating right now. fish that are flat and uh, sideways, not like an ordinary fish. Um, when they're about six months old, the, the left eye will shift over the snout to the other side uh, of the head, the top of the head, and they'll, whoa, and they'll, uh, they'll look like this. Stop it. You can be caught anywhere from 90 to 3,600 feet deep in the ocean. Another interesting fact, the uh, largest halibut ever caught, 427 pounds. Well, it never changed for millions and millions of years. It, it was born ugly and it stayed ugly. It never improved. In fact, it might be going the opposite way. It might be getting uglier and uglier. But they taste good. <laughs> Not as easy as it looks. It's mine. Petersburg, we head to Prince of Wales Island to visit the town of Klawak. Like many of the communities on Prince of Wales Island, Klawak has a history rooted in fishing and logging. But it also has the distinction of having the largest collection of totem poles in the state. Now, this is Totem Park, where poles are now in varying stages of decay. 
But over the next handful of years, the city is taking on the monumental task of restoring the park by recarving from scratch 20 exact replicas of these poles. You're using big, big tools in the beginning and you're, you're down to, you know, when you're getting close to the end, you're starting to just to use real small stuff. I think the first one we did probably took about 250, 260 hours, maybe. I don't know, guesstimating, you know. Um, just like anything else, you start learning new shortcuts and things to speed things up, you know. So it's, it's gotten a little faster. What does that say on the front? It says Ganachadi hit. This house of the Ganachadi. They were the first along with the Tekwedi that settled here, you know, 10,000 years ago. Ganachadi? Yeah. People from Ganach. It's basically our community meeting place, you know, and storage place right now for our, our new totems. These are ones that you've already completed? Yeah. Around here? Yeah. These poles came from a village called Tuxikon. And... That was a winter village of our people. As to who carved them, I guess as good as mine. Um, it's, it's pretty far back. Um, there's some, you know, from the old pictures you can tell there was, there, on some of them there was one, one main carver that was doing, you know, mm -hmm. you could see his style. That's, Before, that's yeah. pure Tuxican style right there. Well, for me it's, uh, it's pretty, um, a pretty awesome feeling to, to be able to contribute something back to, to, to my town, you know, um, something that my kids can say, oh, my grandpa, you know, my dad did this and my grandpa did that, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty awesome feeling, you know. Seems like I've been around it, you know, pretty much all my life. Mm -hmm. um, had a teacher in uh, grade school that taught us how to use chisels, you know, make canoes with them and uh, plaques and then went to high school and had a Simpson teacher, he's a master carver. Um, and all through high school, it's, I pretty much lived in that classroom and at his house. I've got two apprentices here and a past student that, uh, that are, are deep into it. Uh, and I, I get to pick the cream and crop, you know. I'm working on the wings for the eagle that's gonna be going on the top of this pole here. <clears throat> Just trying to get them done today, so mounted and everything. <laughs> on both totem poles, I did the texture adding you know, on the shafts and everything. And just all depends on what John wants me to do, and I'll do it. And this role, you know, you're kind of like an uncle. Well, these are, this is my niece and nephew. And so sometimes you have to be harsh, you know. If these guys get up to snuff, then We'll run side by side, two poles going at once uh, next summer. Yeah, we should be able to get three done a season, maybe. All depends, you know. Yeah. Whatever the wood says. We leave Klawak still months away from their celebration to take part in an annual festival just kicking off in the village of Cake on the northern end of Kupernoff Island. I'm an incredibly nervous flyer. I hate to fly. It's the worst mode of transportation, I think. And uh, I, the smaller the plane, the more scared I am. So uh, I'm looking forward to about an hour of uh, hair-raising terror on this plane flight. <sighs>
Cake is notable for being the first Alaskan Native village to organize under federal law, but its transition into U.S. citizenship was far from smooth. In 1869, following the murder of a Cake native in Sitka by a non-native, the residents of Cake killed two white prospectors in accordance with their customs of retaliation. In response, the Navy sent the USS Saginaw to shell the entire village. The people of Cake dispersed, mixing in with other tribes, and spent the next 20 years gradually regrouping and rebuilding in its current town site. Cake's annual dog salmon festival is now in its 11th year. As the story goes, it was originally planned to coincide with the midpoint of the fish processing season when three million pounds of salmon had been processed. Since the closure of the cold storage plant, times are hard for the residents of Cake and the festival has taken on new value for the town. Enjoy yourselves today. There's a wide variety of events for all age groups. It's a lot of fun, and if you're first time coming to this, you'll want to come back just like the dog salmon. As you can smell all of the nice odors coming around here, there's a lot of food being sold. Whoa! This is fry bread. I've got a feeling I'm going to be doing a lot of eating today. I think that's probably what's going to happen. Oh, we want to welcome all of you to our 11th annual Dog Salmon Festival. Many times there are rules to live by, and I have four of them today. Number one, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Number two, don't drink and drive. Number three, party responsibly. And number four, don't eat farmed fish. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for the it's a chance to take a break, and enjoy yourself, and we, we have family and friends from all over Southeast, or literally from all over the United States, come to visit during this festival, and it's always a big gathering and a big party. So. <laughs> And Bill's going to show everybody from Cake Alaska how to fish. Go. So what's the trick to this? Not to flip over. <laughs> what's going to happen is that uh, my partner Michelle and I are going to win this toad race. Uh, she's already a championship canoeer today. Her, her ladies canoe team won the canoeing event earlier. She says she's tired, but I got a feeling I think she's got I think she's got a, a winning toad race left in her too. So. What's that? Go! Go! I was tired. Oh. My shoulder feels like jello, but look, second place, 30 bucks. Nice work. Yeah, you did most of the work. Well, what started in the state capitol ends here, in a town of 700. You know, uh, I don't know when I'm going to find more memorable, watching whales breach or paddling for my life in a tiny fish box. But it doesn't matter whether you're traveling by cruise ship or ferry or pants crappingly small airplane. The islands of Southeast Alaska have something to offer for the adventurous traveler searching for rich and vibrant culture, abundant marine life, or maybe just some salmon with your eggs for breakfast.
For more information on the places visited on this or other episodes of Anywhere Alaska, as well as behind-the-scenes photos and additional travel options in the state, you can find us online at anywherealaska.org. To order a DVD of the first four episodes of Anywhere Alaska, send $29.95 plus shipping and handling to KUAC-TV, P.O. Box 755-620, Fairbanks, Alaska 99775 or order online at anywherealaska.org. This program is funded in part by the University of Alaska, by the University of Alaska Geography Program, and by the University of Alaska Fairbanks, America's Arctic University. Additional funding provided by the Alaska Travel Industry Association, promoting travel in the state of Alaska.